I used to joke with my Anglo friends that one day Latinos would be a force to be reckoned with. They would laugh, and sometimes I did too. Not anymore. Latinos now are indisputably recognized as a major part of this country and the future of this country. Well, it's a really uh, interesting, transformative, tense, uh, exciting time. And I think the giant's waking up. So each time I speak, each time I run, each time I write an opinion, it's not just me writing it, it is an example of what we can be. Part of reducing the dropout rate is providing the education to the parents and working hand in hand with them. In the state of Washington, I think the last I heard was about $14 billion in, in buying purchasing power. It's not like I tell everyone, you know, I'm a documented or I'm a dreamer. Production of Latinos, the Changing Face of Washington was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. I'm Enrique Cerna. I'm the son of Mexican immigrants. My family settled in Washington State in the 1940s. Since then, the Latino population has grown dramatically. We've moved from farms and fields to become teachers, doctors, business owners, judges, and even journalists. Still, there's a sense the Latino voice has yet to be heard, understood, and even respected. As the Latino presence grows, there are many working to bring change in politics, education, immigration, and entrepreneurship. It's change my parents could never have imagined. In 1946, my parents, Serafin and Josefa Serna, along with my oldest sister and two older brothers, left Mexico for the United States. They rode a train for four long days and finally arrived at their destination, Toppenish, Washington, in the Acoma Valley. My grandparents, Tomas and Felicita Serna, lived there. They came to the valley from Wyoming in 1940. My grandfather decided to move the family to Washington after hearing from his sons working the migrant stream. They told him of fertile land, an opportunity to farm in the valley. You, you talk to some of the old, old families, and, and, and I have, and, and I, I pose the same question to them, why did you come? And the, the short answer is I found things here better than what I left behind. Most of my grandparents' 14 children settled in Washington. Along with other Latino families, they set the foundation for today's growing Latino presence in the state. Was it easy for them? Uh, absolutely not. It was very, very difficult. They, they were, these were families that were coming to essentially an, an alien uh, world. Erasmo Gamboa was raised in the Yakima Valley. He's an associate professor of history at the University of Washington and has written extensively about the Latino experience in the state. The Latino Mexican community uh, in the state of Washington during the 40s, it's in its embryonic stage. It's just beginning to gel. Uh, but that gelling, that formation of community is remarkably fast. World War II was a turning point for Latinos as they established their importance to the state's economy. They played a critical role filling labor shortages in the agricultural areas. President Roosevelt calls for record levels of production to feed the nation, to feed the standing army, to feed the allies abroad. So farm labor is critical. Migrant workers of Mexican descent and Mexican nationals contracted through the Bracero program, a guest worker agreement between the U.S. and Mexico, harvested the crops and covered the labor needs in the railroad industry. 
the railroad is the artery that connects places like Yakima County that, that is, has an incredible capacity to produce to national and world markets. And that is the other part of the Bracero program, that they brought these railroad workers to maintain these critical transportation arteries across the country. As the war ended and the Braceros returned home, Mexican migrant workers from other states were recruited to work the fields in central and eastern Washington. Many decided to stay. And there were some pronounced um, migratory streams. One started from the southwest up into uh, Wyoming, into Colorado, into Montana, across into Idaho, and then into Washington State. So that by the 1940s and 1950s, what do you find during Fourth of July in Toppenish and in Wapato? You see Mexicans on the back of flatbed trucks. They have joined the parade, so to speak. My family joined in that parade as we settled near Wapato. My father farmed some 300 acres of sugar beets, corn, wheat, and produce. And we balanced two cultures, Mexican and American. At times, it was challenging. To be blunt, there was racial animosity towards Mexican people. Migration and immigration is traumatic. It's always stressful. But with time, they begin to consider themselves almost native to, the, to, to Yakima County, as I feel. And I think, Enrique, that is what separates sort of your family, my family, from the new generation of recent arrivals, that we can claim a presence in Yakima County and in other parts of Washington State that others cannot claim, that we were, in a way, sort of pioneers. As my older siblings, Angelica, Peter, and Serafin Jr. reached adulthood in the late 50s and early 60s, they became the Latino pioneers who moved away from agriculture to settle in urban and suburban areas of Western Washington. Of the more than 800,000 Latinos in Washington state, about 325,000 now reside in King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties, the most populated counties in the state. Most are of Mexican descent, but there is a growing number from Central and South America, plus the Caribbean. As the population increases, there is a significant decrease in the number working in agriculture. Like our older siblings, my sister Sally and I left the farm life behind to seek careers in education and journalism. We have a large percentage of Latino professionals now, second generation and even first generation, they have gone to college and now come back. And there's a growing percentage of entrepreneurs as well. They start opening the little shops and things like that, and the bakeries, the restaurant. They're the ones who are bringing that economy back to life. And they're doing it by themselves. They're not, you know, banks can lend them money. The growing Latino population has great potential to achieve economic power. Reaching that potential with a unified voice is still a significant challenge. And how influential we become in education, and economic development, and in politics, it's going to be up to us. This is my grandmother here in this <laughs> Isn't that photo. wonderful? Phyllis Gutierrez Kenny and I share a connection. This is my mother, right. and this is Mrs. Fonseca, and your grandmother. My grandmother. Serna. Felicita Serna, yeah. We are the children of Mexican immigrants. This was a women's club, right? Yes, yes, uh, in the church. Our families knew each other. That's a wonderful picture. And we grew up in Wapato. It's there that we learned about the challenges of culture, class, and race. Those experiences helped to prepare Phyllis Gutierrez Kenny for a future in politics as one of only three Latinas to serve in the Washington State Legislature. Eight terms I won every year with um, over 79 to 80% of the vote in this district. She was born Maria Felipa Gutierrez in Hardin, Montana, the daughter of migrant workers, the seventh of eight children. We were all born in different states when they were working, traveling the crops. My sisters in Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, you name it. And I happened to have been born in Montana where they were doing the sugar beets. 
1941, the family settled down in Wapato. We were able to live in a real house, so that was nice. While the migrant travel ended, work in the fields did not, even for the youngest members of the Gutierrez family. I started working in the potato fields at the age of five. My um, brother was the picker, as they used to call them, with the, the potato belts, and it was very hard, back-breaking work. The migrant life made it tough for the older Gutierrez siblings to get much schooling. Once the family settled, their parents made sure the two youngest attended regularly. That's when Maria Felipa became Phyllis. There was still a lot of discrimination, but I was fortunate because I had a couple of good teachers. My first grade teacher, for one, Mrs. Wilcox, and she was helping me learn English. But one thing she told me they'll always remember, she says, never forget your Spanish. She didn't, nor did she forget how her parents made a point of helping others in their community. She remembers her mother opening their home to braceros. No matter how many people came to the house hungry, she fed them. I don't know how, but she fed them. And her father proudly sharing their Mexican traditions at parades and community events. When Phyllis's father became ill and died, her mother raised the family alone. She became an entrepreneur, opening Wapato's first Mexican restaurant. They laid some of what I feel was a good groundwork for us, and always that if we wanted to do something, we could do it. Si teníamos la ganas, if we had the desire that we could do it, but we had to work for it. Phyllis married young, and like her parents, she raised eight children. They used to ask me, are you Catholic or Mormon? <laughs> <laughs> While living in the Tri-Cities, Phyllis became active in Latino community outreach through the Catholic Church. She played a role in establishing migrant daycare centers and the Washington Migrant Council. There were so many things that still needed a change, and some of the change needed in educating our people that they needed to be respected, that they needed to have that dignity, that they were part of the fabric of that town. After a divorce, Phyllis moved her family to the Seattle area, where she met and married prominent labor leader Larry Kenny, a strong advocate for farm workers. He supported and encouraged her when she took her first shot at political office, running unsuccessfully for Secretary of State in 1996. It was a great experience for me. I did loved it. I got to go on the back road tour with the Clintons and Gore and everybody else. That exposure caught the attention of the 46 district Democrats who backed her appointment to the district's vacant state house seat in 1997. She held the post for 16 years, championing farm worker housing, vocational training, opportunity education grants for the low income, and in-state college tuition for undocumented students. She also played a significant role in boosting the state's wine industry with legislation that established viticulture programs at state colleges and universities. Do you think your parents would ever have imagined that one day their daughter would get involved in politics? No, and you're going to make me cry. <laughs> no. And I wish they would have been alive to do that, to see me. At 78, retired from the legislature and recently widowed, it would seem that Maria Felipa Gutierrez Kenny would slow down. But not now. Instead, she's heading up a leadership institute for CIMAR Community Health Clinic. I want to see Latino bank presidents. I want to see Latino and Latina presidents of universities and colleges. I want to see Latinos to be on every bank board around and to corporate boards. I've heard some Latinos say that we're our own worst enemy because we don't work together well. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because it's true. It's like a pot of crabs. You know, when one crab starts climbing up and ready to go out, they pull him back down. And we're still experiencing some of that. La envidia. Envy. But what we have to learn is that when it comes down to doing something, if we can come together and be a strong voice, that's where it's going to count. Okay, I call the meeting to order. 
the Toppenish City Council is in session. Let the record show that we do have full attendance tonight. Mayor Clara Jimenez is in charge. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. It's such an honor and a privilege knowing where I came from, you know, working in the fields, being a migrant farm worker when I was six to now sitting on the council. Never would have dreamed of doing such a thing. Clara Jimenez has been doing this thing since 1996 when she was first elected to the Toppenish City Council. She's now in her final year serving as the city's mayor. So when you go in the community, what do people say? And they see you as the mayor. They're always surprised if they don't really know me, if they haven't, if they aren't really from our community, then they're surprised because I don't fit their mold because their mole is a white Caucasian male. <laughs> so when I show up, it's like, no, it can't be her. Yeah. So, yeah. Clara works as a first grade teacher in Yakima, but Toppenish is home, and serving on the council is her way of giving back. Do you see yourself as being the voice for the, the Latino community here? I see myself more as a voice for all who resided in the community of Toppenish, because I wear many hats. I mean. I'm Latina, but I'm also a woman, I'm also a mother, I'm also a sister, you know, so I'm a little bit of everything. And that includes being among the few Latinos to hold political office in Washington state. It does bother me. It does bother me that we do have qualified individuals out there who would great, be great, great council members or legislators. And when they do run, they're not elected. Ten counties, most in central and eastern Washington, have the highest percentage of Latino population. In Adams and Franklin counties, Latinos are the majority, making up more than 50% of the population. Yakima County is third with 45%. The other seven counties range from near 40 to 17%. Overall, Latinos make up more than a third of the population in the 10 counties. But when you break down the total number of office holders versus the number of Latino office holders in those 10 heavily Latino counties, you find a dearth of Latino representation of just 4%. So the population is growing faster than the, the level of representation is growing. So by that measure, the problem is actually getting worse. Paul Apostolidis is a political science professor at Whitman College in Walla Walla. Among his ongoing community research projects is the state of the state for Washington Latinos. I started studying this issue back in 2002. Apostolitas and his team of student researchers documented the lack of Latino political representation and its impact on voting rights, education, health care, and housing. Everybody has something at stake here. If you want a more inclusive society, a more harmonious uh, local community, and if you want to just solve problems that are common, you need as many people as possible involved in the process. Is race an issue? Race is most certainly an issue. And when I say that, I mean that we're talking about historically embedded uh, patterns of inequality. Because if you don't have equal access to education and you don't have equal access to employment uh, opportunities um, and upward mobility, that's going to be reflected in, uh, you know, a group's ability to groom candidates, to run successfully for local office, to do the fundraising that any candidate needs to do. Every candidate has to prove himself or herself to get elected. There's no doubt about that. State Supreme Court Justice Stephen Gonzalez knows that well. In 2012, he became the first Mexican-American elected to the state high court. I may have felt the pressure a little bit more as the first person with an obviously ethnic surname uh, running a statewide election. I felt that if I didn't win, it wouldn't just reflect on me, but it might affect future races as well. So I felt a little bit of that, of that pressure. Appointed to the Supreme Court in January 2012 by Governor Chris Gregoire, the former King County Superior Court judge campaigned hard to win a full six-year term. He was endorsed by Republicans, Democrats, and editorial boards throughout the state. He was rated exceptionally well qualified by legal and civic organizations, and he made a point of campaigning statewide. To be perfectly blunt, uh, a number of the political advisors said, you don't need the eastern side of the state to win, focus on western Washington. Uh, that practically may be accurate, but it wasn't the way I wanted to run a statewide campaign.
Other than file for the post, his opponent, Kitsap County Attorney Bruce Danielson, did nothing. He didn't campaign, debate, or fundraise. He received no endorsements and was rated not qualified for the job by multiple civic organizations. On primary election night, Justice Gonzalez won with more than 60 percent of the vote statewide, avoiding a runoff with Danielson in the general election. The victory, however, was bittersweet. I didn't win any counties in eastern Washington. Uh, in fact, lost a number of them by a significant margin. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. The Gonzalez race really highlighted uh, a lot of concerns uh, for people here in Washington state who are troubled by the lack of representation of Latinos. Matt Barreto is a University of Washington political science professor and the director of the nonpartisan Washington Poll. After the election, he examined the voting results in central and eastern Washington, precinct by precinct, and concluded that racially polarized voting played a role in the final outcome. And the Gonzalez election really highlighted um, the fact that there are a number of voters here in Washington state happen to be concentrated in central and eastern Washington in these same locales that have experienced rapid Latino population growth that are block voting against Spanish surname candidates. Justice Gonzalez won easily in the most populated counties of the state in western Washington. But overall, Bruce Danielson still received 42 percent of the vote, winning 30 of the state's 39 counties. He even won the 10 heavily Latino counties. How do you respond to those that say, well, you know, you're throwing up the race card here, but really you're looking at areas that are Republican and that are more conservative, and so he didn't fit the profile. What we did was we compared that, and first we looked at Susan Owens, uh, another Supreme Court justice uh, who was also progressive and was running against a conservative. And guess what? She won every single one of those counties. The ones that Gonzalez lost, Owens, who doesn't have a Spanish surname, she won all of those. But it was just Gonzalez, again, running against an opponent with no ads, no campaign whatsoever. Uh, and this opponent, Danielson, was able to beat Gonzalez, do better than Rob McKenna did uh, in these counties uh, and these individual precincts. That allowed us to really isolate the fact that the only thing driving this was race and ethnicity. Latinos have been around here since before this was a nation. It's ironic to have people say to me that you'll have a hard time because your name isn't American enough. And that's exactly how some people put it. Gonzalez is an American name. Uh, it always has been, and it always will be. Uh, until we get to the point where we all understand that, we'll continue to have problems. The Gonzalez race has led to calls for state voting reforms, specifically passage of a Washington Voting Rights Act to address racially polarized voting and to allow for legal challenges to at-large elections that lock out minority candidates. But a Voting Rights Act bill proposed by State Representative Luis Moscoso, the only Latino currently serving in the state legislature, went nowhere. Meantime, the ACLU joined with two Yakima Latino residents to file a federal voting rights lawsuit against the city of Yakima. The suit challenges the system for city council elections in an effort to improve the odds of minority candidates. Gracias. Yakima's Latino population is more than 40 percent, but a Latino has never been elected to the city council. There is a abundant political science research, first of all, that shows that if you change the voting rules, moving from at-large elections to district elections, you really do increase the rate of minority representation. But that's not just cosmetically important, that also means better public policy. I really appreciate what she's done as well as the other individuals who partake in this. Back in Toppenish, Mayor Clara Jimenez is wrapping up the city council meeting. She has often been the lone Latino representative. She wants to see more Latinos running for the council and other offices. For Clara, it's all about getting the Latino community involved in the political process. As Latinos. We need to step up, too, and start voting. And I think that we also need to take a role in recruiting people to run and backing them. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Whatever it takes, we need to do that.
Or should you be? John Cerna is my cousin. He's the superintendent of the Toppany School District. What grade you guys in? All fifth graders? Yeah. Fifth graders? I'm on TV. <laughs> We're part of the second generation of Cernas who got the chance to go to college and become professionals. We left the farm and fields, but never forgot where we came from. You guys are going to be on TV. We are? Yeah. Cool. It's especially true for John. His roots in Toppenish are deep. This community is my life. I was raised here. I guess it's almost like priceless because I chose to come back here and live here and live my life here. So it means almost everything. Let's walk. Good job, you guys. Good job. Good job. Good job. Coming back and giving back runs in the family. His father, the late Tomas Serna Jr., graduated from Toppenish High in 1949 and was well known here for his work on behalf of the Latino community. John and his siblings are also Toppenish graduates. After college, he landed a teaching job here in 1979. I was one of the few Mexican teachers at that time, and there were a few of us in a district of over 200 teachers. John began a long climb up the ladder from teacher and coach to assistant principal, principal to assistant superintendent. Then in 2010, he got the top job as he was named superintendent. I was a migrant kid at one time in my early, early years, and I always have been a farm laborer, and understanding that's a tough life. Toppenish is on the Yakima Indian Reservation. It has a population of about 9,000. The town is well known for its colorful murals, depicting the history of the Yakimas, the early settlers here, and farm workers who worked the fields. Like many communities, Toppenish faces difficult challenges. There's a high rate of poverty in the area, and the community has fought hard to curb gang violence. They're filming you guys. You guys are going to be stars. The makeup of the school district has changed dramatically since John was a student here. It looks like you're getting big. I am. <laughs> Latinos are now more than 80% of the student population. Keeping those kids in school isn't easy. 60% of our parents have not graduated in this community. 60%. It's unreal. Reducing the Latino dropout rate is a major challenge throughout the nation, especially with the Latino student population growing at an unprecedented pace. According to the Office of State Public Instruction, Washington State's Latino student population has increased 237 percent since 1993. It's estimated that at best 60 percent of Latino students graduate within four to six years of high school. Uh, there are only 13% of Latinos who have a bachelor's degree in the country. Whether they go on to a two-year, four-year institution or university, or they go to a trade school, they have to be prepared for the real world. To make that happen, Toppenish has turned to robotics. It's part of the district STEM program at the middle and high school level. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Five years ago, John Cerna was encouraged by his nephew, a former NASA engineer, to look into STEM. That led to the school district applying for and receiving a grant to implement STEM with classes in biomedical science, computer software, and engineering. Through STEM, the high school has created an award-winning robotics team that's part of the engineering course. And along the way, students like Omar Palomino discovered a career path. I kind of want to be a mechanical engineer or somewhere along those, along those lines. Toppenish is now moving STEM into its elementary schools. It's one of 44 school districts in the nation to do so. It will also become the only school district in Washington state with a K-12 through STEM curriculum. We had one kid that was a former gangbanger. I mean... And he, he got involved in the robotics. He took some engineering classes. And now he's going to college. And if he hadn't, he probably might be in jail right now. Could be dead. I don't know. But he, you know, I saw that 
program turned that one kid around because he was headed nowhere. The emphasis on STEM has paid off. Toppenish is now graduating more than 92% of its students. But there's something else going on here that's making a difference. How long ago was that, huh? Oh, like <laughs> 25 years Oh, ago. long time ago. <laughs> it's a personal connection that John Cerna has pushed with his former students to come back and give back to the school and community. I made no bones about it. I want to hire kids that went through a system that have gone away to college that are highly qualified to come back and teach our kids. And a lot of those young people were bilingual and so they can have an immediate impact on our kids and our parents in this community. I felt that I could make a difference by coming back. Veronica Romero and Enrique Romero aren't related, but they are John Cerna's former no, students. They are now part of the Toppenish High School staff. It's helped me in the classroom because I know the, I know the kids, I know their family, I know their struggles. All of this needs to be done by next Friday. Enrique teaches STEM classes. And let's make sure that you have the right classes that you need to take. Oh, you're going to do year-long English, UW English? Yes. Veronica is a here. guidance counselor who works with high-risk students and their families. Just providing a lot of information to a lot of our, our families that they have no idea where to get the resources. No, not that one. Not the first floor. The second and floor. often that means working with parents who only speak Spanish. And the, and the parents says, ¿Cómo, cómo, ¿Cómo es que no sabes qué hacer? ¿O qué es lo que vas a hacer? ¿Por qué no, por qué no te haces como un maestro, como el señor Romero? Aquí, él se recibió de aquí. You know, why don't you become like, like Mr. Romero? He graduated from Toppenish. You know, he's a teacher. I feel, I feel a sense of responsibility because now the parent is saying, Look, Mr. Romero, he comes from your background. You know, he's a good role model for you. Why don't you follow his example? Are you the new generation that will make the difference in developing these young people, not just as students, but as leaders in the community? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think kids need to be able to see themselves in somebody else that they see as a role model and then be able to picture themselves at a higher capacity. When Mr. Cerno was here, we were able to build that relationship with him. And that's what a lot of our students are doing with us now. If I could mold some more young people that are gonna become administrators in the future in this community and maybe take over someday, and they have that, that same passion and the same expectations, then I've done my job. My motto in everything I do in the industry is, where there's music, there'll be life. Where there's life, there should be wine. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to, to Victor cool. here, uh, who's one of our our biggest success stories. So. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Victor Palencia is living his American dream. Let's do some tasting. Cool. He's the director of winemaking for the Mattawa-based JNS Crushing, one of the largest winemakers in the state, and head winemaker for Jones of Washington and its winery in Quincy. There's about 50 to 60 ton average on these little guys, um, and we can do up to 77 again on the, on the bigger ones. On this day, Victor is talking winemaking with enology and viticulture students from his alma mater, Walla Walla Community College, where he honed his winemaking knowledge. Now thinking back, it was, uh, it was a great opportunity to, to just get a head start in, in what I'm doing today. Victor was just 22 when he joined JNS Crushing, then just a startup custom crush operation. Let's walk straight down to the next room. I'll show you our, uh, our slush room. He was tasked with overseeing the construction of this massive winemaking facility that now has the capacity to produce more than a million cases of wine a year. It was a tremendous responsibility for someone so young, but the owners saw an incredible talent and Victor didn't let them down. Now at 28, he's considered one of the top winemakers in the state, with his wines winning numerous regional and national awards. Victor's winemaking talent 
helped Jones of Washington win another major honor from Wine Press Northwest, 2012 Winery of the Year. Everything that we did, design, layout, is applied to the winemaking techniques that I learned in the boutique world, and, and I'm in it to make good wine. In many ways, Victor Palencia seemed destined for a life amid the vineyards and to live his motto of musica, vida y vino. I was born in Michoacán, Mexico, in a small town, uh, Villa Jimenez, uh, but I, I grew up in Prosser, Washington, the heart of Washington wine industry. Victor was two when his family arrived in central Washington. His father, David, found work in the nearby orchards and vineyards, where Victor would eventually work as well. I wanted to be like my dad. I, I wanted to work you know, as, as hard as he did, and um, you know, he, he always uh, was a great role model. Victor's father became a foreman for a vineyard. As Victor worked with him, his interest in grapes and wine took hold. But then creating this masterpiece is art, form of art through wine and putting it all together, that, that's why I say, wow, this is me, this is what I want to do. Right now, what we're doing is trying to establish our canopy and state of growth, uh, and this sunshine is perfect for that. Victor's entry into winemaking began at 17 while he was still in high school. He landed a job at his neighbor's winery, Willowcrest, where he quickly worked his way up to assistant winemaker, even though he wasn't old enough to legally drink the wine. That's a privilege that not a lot of folks get, especially at that age. After graduating from high school, Victor enrolled at Walla Walla Community College and its highly regarded enology and viticulture program. His age became an issue because at the time, students were required to be 21. It's pretty rare for somebody as young as he is to get it as quick as he does. Program he director so Tim Donahue uh, says the requirement was waived for Victor because he already had so much hands-on <laughs> experience in the industry. I very rarely meet people that just absolutely fundamentally get winemaking. They do at their core, top to bottom. It's a pretty rare trait because of all the different things, aspects of your brain you have to access as a winemaker, and he gets it, and he just does. And I, I, I you know, it's just a, a remarkable person that can do that. I understood what I was doing, but I never quite grasped why, you know, the overcast over everything. And Walla Walla for me was that clearing that overcast. The school was very hands-on. And I, I felt at home. I love what I did there, the, the people, the culture. I mean, everyone breathed, talked, lived wine. And that was, for me, the strength that just solidified my, my, my foundation for my career. I look for a few key things in any wine, regardless of variety, vintage. Um, it's aroma, color, mouthfeel, and finish. In the early years, before he could legally taste the wine he was creating, Victor had to rely heavily on his sense of smell. He considers it an art form that is critical to his success. With winemaking, you spend a lot of your time creating something, uh, a style, a flavor, a character, you know, and you can do a lot through, through the smell, through the sense of aroma, and I have a really sensitive nose, and uh, I can see a lot in a wine just by smelling it before I even taste it, and that's, that's an advantage I used early today. Initially, Victor's parents were not thrilled about his winemaking career, especially his mother, Rosalia. She worried the wine tasting part of the job might make him an alcoholic. It took a while, but she came to accept her son's work and is now proud of his success. In turn, Victor credits his parents for the sacrifices they made to come to America, giving him an opportunity to become a trailblazer. Not a lot of Latinos working as winemakers. No, and I, and I understand that, and I, and I knew that, getting into this industry. Um, but maybe that's, that's why I'm doing it. It's, it's I want to make a difference. Um, you know, wine is now part of our culture. We help craft the vineyards. We, we, we are part of the viticulture. The Sauvignon Blanc is dry. Being Latino to me is, is everything. It, it's who I am. Um, one of the greatest gifts that I was given from my parents is, is to be proud of who you are. And, uh, and I love my culture. Uh, I think at one point it was probably the greatest challenge and, uh, and burdens that I carried. But now I, I, I feel like it's a gift. How is it a burden? When you're the new generation or uh, I had the age factor involved, but also the fact that there wasn't a lot of Latinos. In the, so fitting in means everything. 
in, in any environment, and uh, it took some work to fit in. Victor Palencia is now looking to expand his winemaking dream. He's preparing to launch the Palencia Wine Company and his own label. There is an image of a farm worker mm -hmm. with a shovel. Your father? You nailed it. The shovel is very symbolic to me. There is no man in this world that can run a shovel like my father. And it definitely represents not only my father, but great, hardworking people like my father. Latinos, it's a growing community, but uh, what I'm most excited about is when I start seeing entrepreneurs, I want to be able to do what I can to help. And if I can do that through wine, that would be my ultimate dream. My name is Jessica Sparza, and I am originally from Durango, Mexico. I currently live in Quincy, Washington, and I am here at Big Bang Community College doing my associate's degree. Jessica Esparza is a dreamer in more ways than one. She dreams of becoming a registered nurse and one day a citizen of the United States. And it's just hard to just come out and say, I'm undocumented or I'm a dreamer or I don't have papers. Jessica and many others like her are the human side of the comprehensive immigration reform debate, where they are often overshadowed by politics and ideology. Dreamers are young people, often infants, often people under the age of 10, who come here because of a choice their parents have made, most often, to move to the United States with or without papers. For dreamers, it's without papers, right? To move to the United States to try to provide more opportunities for their children. They are called DREAMers because of the DREAM Act, Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors. It's an important piece of legislation for thousands of people living in America. It was first proposed to Congress in 2001 by U.S. Senators Dick Durbin, a Democrat from Illinois, and Utah Republican Orrin Hatch. They're the honor roll students, the star athletes, the talented artists, the class valedictorians. The DREAM Act would allow those who qualify a path to permanent residency and citizenship. In addition, students would be eligible for federal financial aid. What do we call this layer right here? Epicardium. The Immigration Policy Center estimates that some 35,000 dreamers like Jessica live in Washington state. I've had a number of dreamers here in the time that I've been at the University of Washington. These students, in my experience, know and live the sacrifices that their parents made to try to provide them those opportunities. They make those sacrifices themselves. For years, Jessica Esparza's father would leave the family in Mexico and travel to Washington State to work in the farms and fields. While he was away, Jessica made her mark in school as an outstanding student. So I started kinder really young. I was always student number one. Went to competitions for first grade and sixth grade, like state competitions, and always got first place. In the summer of 2005, Jessica's mother decided she wanted the family together. So she brought the kids north to live near Quincy. I was 11 and I had no knowledge or no saying on any of my parents' decisions. The move was hard. There was a new language, a different culture, and a group of mean girls. I was getting bullied by Hispanic girls because I didn't speak English. In the bus, they wouldn't let me sit with them. They would like put their legs on the seat. And at school, they would push me around, close my locker on my face, pull my hair, uh, make fun of me. I couldn't go complain because I didn't speak English. So I was just stay quiet. Did you ever want to just quit school? Oh yeah, many times, like my first year, I would ask my mom to just send me back to Mexico with my grandma. I would beg her to just send me back, but she didn't want to do it. What did your mom say to you? She told me to just suck it up, <laughs> <laughs> ignore everything, and you know, it was about my grades, it was about school, and I wasn't going to let some girls put me down. Even with limited English speaking skills, Jessica became a top student, excelling in math, biology, and chemistry. 
In eighth grade, she earned a summer scholarship to the NASA Space Academy in Alabama. I managed to get like all A's and like even one B, seventh grade, without speaking English fluently. Jessica went on to become one of the top 10 students in her class, earning honors in sports, community service, and academics. But in her senior year, reality hit. Her undocumented status prevented her from receiving federal or state financial aid and a chance to attend a major university. It was heartbreaking. Um, I cried a lot of nights about it, you know. I wouldn't blame my parents, but like I would ask them, you know, like, why did you bring me here? Like, I was going to school in Mexico and things were going well. Like, why did I have to come here? So it's kind of hard, the situation that I'm in, but things are getting better. And I mean, I got this far, so I know that I can get farther in life. So this is for lecture. Yeah. And she is. Jessica's excellent academic record helped as she pursued scholarships to attend Big Ben Community College in Moses Lake. It, it sucks sometimes, but maybe if I had like had an easy life, I wouldn't be this person that I am today. You know, I wouldn't be as strong. I wouldn't be as, I wouldn't be working as hard to get where I want to be. You have a growing Latino student population here. Yes, 35% at last uh, census. And the number of dreamers, I take it, has probably been increasing. We think so. It's hard to track. Uh, it's not something that we ask about. Terry Lease is the president of Big Bend Community College, where he says dreamers are welcome. The school's foundation is providing financial assistance to dreamers who need it. And dreamers are individuals who have gone through our K-12 systems. We've invested enormous amounts of energy and money in their education. This is an opportunity not only for them to get the payoff with coming to college and getting a career path that will lead to a better life, but it's also an opportunity for us to have skilled workers that are likely to stay in our communities. You know, I can remember when I worked at Yakima Valley Community College and driving up along the interstate and watching the workers out in the fields and wondering, you know, which one of them, if given an opportunity to get an education, might be the one that discovers a cure for cancer. You just, there's so much potential. And we need to do everything we can as a society to help them reach that potential and, and then we all benefit. Being a nurse, what's that mean to you? Uh, it means that I'm going to be able to provide health care to other community members. Yeah, I'm going to be able to make a difference, you know. I might save a life if I work in the emergency room. And you want to come back here? Yeah, I, I, like, I like this town. They have given me so much, you know, providing me with scholarships, with, with school, with the great school system. What do you want people to know about dreamers? Uh, all of the dreamers that I know are like really hard workers and they put a lot of work into their school, into just doing more, you know, being outstanding. We're outstanding. It's been nearly 70 years since my parents left Mexico for a new life in Washington State. Like so many other Latino immigrants, they came in search of new opportunities and a better life for their children. Their story is one of migration and immigration, hope and hard work, perseverance and accomplishment, love and family. It is truly an American story. It's the immigrant communities that remind us of the history of our entire country and how it is that we've become as wealthy and powerful with all the challenges that we still have, as wealthy and powerful as we are. In a sense, they are the reminders of the beauty of what brought people here to these shores in the first place. Shortly after I was born in 1953, my parents became American citizens. In spite of whatever challenges they faced here, they were equally proud of being Mexican and American. The influence 
of Mexican people has brought tremendous diversity um, to, to the state of Washington in the same way that the prior generations of prior ethnic groups and prior cultures have contributed to what it means to be a Washingtonian. And I think we are part of that mix. The Latino population in Washington state is at a transformative stage. Its history here is still relatively young, and so are the demographics of its growing population that will likely double in the next decade. Half of all Latinos in the United States are younger than 27, so it's a very young population, and what that means is that it will be growing. Even if there's no more migration, even if no one else moves to Washington state, the population is going to grow um, as that younger population comes of age. Going forward, those young Latinos will have the opportunity to play a significant role in the state's future direction. The Latino voice will grow louder. Primarily, I've been looking at how that has been influenced in politics, and I think we're gonna see rapid growth in voter registration and participation. But it's gonna be in every sector, education, finance, culture, the arts. Anywhere you look, there's going to be a stronger Latino presence here in Washington State. The concern that I have is that the leadership in the state will retrench and not understand that Latinos are a critical part of its own future. And Washington is unlike many other states in the country that have experienced substantial Latino population growth. We can plan for it. We as a state can use this community to help guide us on how to make investments for all youth and for all communities that face challenges of upward mobility in our state. And this community will be supportive of those efforts. There's a saying that goes, there are some who make it happen, there are some who watch it happen, and then there are some who wonder what happened and Latinos are going to make it happen. Production of Latinos, the Changing Face of Washington was made possible in part by a generous grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.